We're going to continue our series through Matthew this morning as we talk about salt and light in a dark and decaying world. Salt and light in a dark and decaying world. Let's, let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, we just, we just sung of your greatness, Lord, and that is our hope. You are a great God. You are the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're the God of Bobby Jones. You're the God of Judy Tomberlin. You are the King, Lord Jesus. And how comforting that is, Lord, that you call us yours, your children, God, citizens of your kingdom. And so we know, God, you're going to fight for us. You're going to act for us. You're going to um, work in and through our lives to bring you the greatest possible glory and bring us the greatest possible joy in you forever. Sometimes that means suffering now, Lord. But oh, sorrow tarries for a night, Lord. But joy comes in the morning. And that's our hope. That's our hope, Lord Jesus. So help us now as we think about what it means to be salt and light in a dark and decaying world. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to uh, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> um, and this text this morning, I, I believe, is very relevant for us. Um, unless you've had your head in the sand, you know that we are living in a time of increasing hostility to the Christian, belie- uh, Christian beliefs and practices. Um, and to oversimplify it, really, we live in a, a clash of worldviews. Um, I think part of the God's grace toward this country and part of the su- reason of its success is that uh, for a, a long time, America enjoyed a general, uh, the, the, the citizens enjoyed a general uh, same worldview uh, built on Christian foundations. But of course, that began to change, um, certainly in the last uh, seven or eight decades, and, and now what we're finding ourselves in is uh, people in, our, in our, you know, our country is divided. And so you have Christians who are, uh, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you're, as, as the Holy Spirit works in your life and in your mind, and as you begin to read his word, and as you begin to worship with other believers, and you hear the word preached, and you and you get on your knees, and you pray to God, and you just fellowship with other believers, your mind begins to become shaped by God and His Word to to think uh, God's thoughts after Him. Your your interpretive grid, your value system, what you consider important and unimportant, the things that you love and don't love, those things begin to become shaped by God and His Word. And And sometimes we as believers, if you've been a believer for a while, I think sometimes we forget what it's like to be lost and where we would be without the Holy Spirit of God. And there's a huge segment of our population who just, reality is, they don't share our beliefs. They don't think like we do. They don't process things like we do. They don't have the same value structure that we do. And so inevitably, there was going to be a collision. And so that's why um, even things that, uh, that, you know, that seems so absurd. Things that we believe seem so absurd to, to many and things that they believe seem so absurd to us. And that is because it, it speaks to the great divergence of the worldview, the worldviews that we have in our nation. Of course, this is no problem for the Bible. This, is, this has always been the case when, in terms of Christianity and the, and the, and the larger society. If we follow Christ, we are going to think differently. We are going to look differently and act differently. So the question for our generation, every generation, is how will we as Christians live in this world? How will, he, how will we live in this world? And it's important here, and we have to be careful here. Because I'm just going to shoot you straight on this. If your hope is in this world, it's going to make you mad. I'm just telling you. It's going to make you mad. If you think we're if you think we're owed America, you just gotta learn we're not. 
We're not owed anything. The, the, the privileges that we enjoy as citizens of this country and have for so long have been gifts from God Almighty. Just, that's, that's all there is to it. And the reality is, is that America is, was, and, and, and always will be temporary. There's only one kingdom that endures forever. It's the kingdom of Christ. And so, if our hope is in this world, we're going to get mad. But if we fight that hope, if we fight that tendency, rather, and hope in Christ, we won't get mad. Because Christ is the king of every nation. And billions of years from this moment right now, if you belong to Christ, you will be shining with him like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. And the best days that this country has ever had will be like the darkest night in that world. And so we have to remember that we've always just been passing through. We are citizens of another kingdom. We belong to another king. Such that if we really believe that, then even if the whole house burns down around us, we don't have to be shaken. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of diseases. We don't have to be afraid of the government. Jesus Christ is Lord of diseases. He's Lord of the government. We trust in him. We do right. We surrender our lives to him. Jesus will take care of the rest. He'll vindicate his people. He'll judge the world. And he'll make everything right. And so we don't have to be afraid. All we have to do is be faithful. It's only this perspective that can enable us to live as we ought in the world. Because if we don't have it, we will get mad. But Jesus didn't get mad. No one in this room has been wrong more than Jesus Christ. He was wrongfully condemned, murdered, hung on a cross, and while he was hanging there, he said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We're to be like Jesus in this world. And so what we want to talk about this morning is being salt for Jesus, salt for Jesus, and shine for Jesus. We're going to be salt for Jesus and shine for Jesus. So first, number one, well, we've got to read our text first. And so, if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. It says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The Word of God. You may be seated. So salt for Jesus and shine for Jesus. Number one, salt for Jesus. You're the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I want to answer three questions concerning being salt for Jesus. We want to ask, what does, why does the world need salt? We want to ask, what does it mean to be salt? And, and number three, we want to ask, when do we lose our saltiness? So the first question I want to answer is, why does the world need salt? Salt was a well-known substance in Jesus' day, just as ours. Everyone would have been familiar with it. Um, Salt was valued. It was was very valuable. It was very useful. It's something that people wanted. And so, you know, um, it's recorded that uh, oftentimes the Roman soldiers would be paid in salt. And so that's where we get the phrase, you know, that person, you know, they're not worth their salt. It was a type of payment. Okay, it was important. Um, There's lots of things that salt does that makes it valuable. But I think in this passage here, uh, the, the primary purpose of salt that Jesus has in mind here, I believe, is that one of the things salt does is it slows decay. 
it slows decay. And before we can even think about what it means for us to be salt, we have to understand what Jesus is saying uh, by the simple fact that he's saying that the world needs salt. And that mean, and what that means is that what Jesus is saying is that the world in which we live is in a state of decay. It's in a state of decay. Advances in technology and medicine, I'm afraid, have deceived many people into thinking that things are getting better. Well, I thank God for advances in technology and medicine. Uh, those are wonderful things. But the problem is, is those things can't help the real problem of humanity, and that is the human heart. I hope. Okay, just making sure. Um, it, that is, those things can't help the human heart, okay? And so the same splitting atom that can power 10,000 homes can also obliterate 10,000 lives in an instant. And so advancing technology doesn't necessarily mean things are getting better. In fact, what it can mean is that there are also better ways to deceive others and to cheat others and manipulate others and honestly waste our lives on frivolous things. You know, we hold more technology in our pockets than what we sent the first man to the moon. Okay? And the, the, this gadget can do so many different things. It's astounding. I mean, j uh, you know, 150 years ago, you could tell someone that I could w look at somebody and talk to them all the way on the other side of the world. They would say it's witchcraft. Okay? But it's reality. But the here's thing is, the same thing that, again, that is supposed to, you know, make things easier and can make calculations that we couldn't do in a billion years, the same thing that does that also is probably the greatest source of wasted time in human history. So just because it's good, just because it's advanced technology doesn't mean it makes our life better. In fact, there's probably many ways in, in which our lives have gotten worse as a result of these things. Can we honestly examine ourselves and our society and say that we love better, serve better, raise our family better, sacrifice ourselves better for the good of others? I'm not sure. You see, we can't understand reality until we understand reality from God's perspective, because his perspective is the, the, the true perspective. And the Bible says that people are not basically good. You see, lots of people, just they, they totally don't get it. If people were basically good, it would be easier to be good than bad. The problem is, we know that's not true. It's easier to be selfish than it is to be selfless. Every time. It's not, we're not basically good. We're basically bad. And so, far from following our heart, we need our hearts changed, transformed, controlled. And we see, that we see this happening, we, we see the breakdown of society all around us. The family is imploding, society is unraveling as more sin abounds, and as more hypersexualization and sexual morality and confusion uh, about things like that and gender identity flourish, the more of its devastating effects we will see. More children raised without one or both parents, children taught to embrace every desire rather than restrain their desires. We have an indulgent society that puts self and pleasure first, no matter the cost, leaving a trail of broken hearts and relationships in its wake. And, all, and, uh, and we just, we just got to be ready because this is the norm. It's going to become more of the norm and there's going to be more bitter fruit to come. And so the question for us then is, what does it mean to be salt in a decaying world? I don't believe, as some seem to, that we are promised to turn around society. I think some people put too much blame on the church by saying things like, well, if we were just truly the church, the country wouldn't be in this mess. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not excusing the faults of the American church, which are many, but when I read my Bible, I don't see where it says that we're guaranteed to win over society. In fact, when I read the Bible, it seems to me to say that as the end gets closer, things are going to get worse, a lot worse, particularly, I believe, 
it teaches it's going to get worse for Christians. In other words, it's going to take a great deal of courage to stand for what the, the church has believed for 2,000 years because the pressure is going to become immense. And we frankly just have to be ready. It's not being alarmist. It's just being reality. I heard an I heard a example the other day of a Winston Churchill. And he was telling the British officials, he was telling them, he said, look what's happening over there in Germany. They're building a ton of planes, and they don't look like passenger planes. They're rerouting their, 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 their resources over there. You need to start paying attention. Nobody listened to him until World War II happened. The signs were there, but they weren't paying attention. We have to be paying attention, and we have to be ready. Ready to what? To stand firm for Jesus Christ. I don't believe we're promised the culture, but I do believe what Jesus is teaching here is that we can slow the decay. We are the salt of the earth. We can, you know, you say, well, what can I do in the face of this? Here's what you can do. You can live a God-honoring, Christ-exalting, holy life for Jesus. That's what you can do. A life of faith-filled obedience to Jesus Christ, applying the Sermon on the Mount in our life. And if we do that, we, we will slow the decay. If we, will be, if we will be faithful in our own families, and if we will train our own children in the way of righteousness, and if we will love our own neighbors as ourselves, and if we will, if we will refuse to, to cut corners or to, or, to, you know, or to cheat or deceive to put things in our favor... We can be the salt of the earth. If we can just, if we become foster and adoptive parents, we can blunt the, the, the trauma and the, the weight of familial sin on the lives of children of those families. If we'll just step in and be the salt of the earth, if we refuse to join in the debaucheries of the world, then perhaps a few will see that refusal and be moved to acknowledge what deep down they know is right, that those things are wrong. You know, sin begets sin, and righteousness begets righteousness. Even an unbeliever, if they see a Christian over here doing right, even if they may follow suit, even if it's just because they don't want to be shown up by the Christian, it doesn't matter if it means that it slows the decay of the world. You know, do you know how many apologies? I'm only 31 years old. Do you know how many apologies I've received from people for bad language when they found out I'm a pastor? Oh, you're a pastor. I'm sorry. Are they really sorry? Probably not. But, hear me now, but if the presence of one Christian just showing up can make something as simple as a conversation more holy and pure then what could the presence of the church of God being salt and light in the world do in this world? It can change things. It can slow the decay. It can make a difference. No, we can't save a, sh a sinking ship. Only God can do that through nationwide awakening and would that he would do it. Would that he would pour out his spirit on high. Would that vast multitudes of American people would fall on their faces before Jesus Christ, acknowledge their need of him, be changed from the inside out to see that his ways is the right way and be changed. But apart from that, apart from that, what we must be is the salt of the earth, to stand for righteousness. And this um, and if we do that, if we do that, then who knows that other people watching our lives might not themselves be a little humble, a little more humble, a little more generous, a little more self-giving, and it can slow the decay of the world. And this leads us to Jesus' stern warning, and the third question we want to answer is, when do we lose our saltiness? Jesus says, if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You see, most of the salt in Jesus' day had lots of impurities. 
And what could happen is that the salt, you know, in, in, in some type of humid condition or, or whatever, the salt could leach out. And then what you'd be left with is just a pile of useless minerals, junk minerals. Okay. And what they would do with this, this junk salt is they would just they would throw it in the road or they would throw it on the roofs, which, you know, the roofs in Jesus' day were flat roofs and often sometimes they'd sleep on the roofs. It was, a, it was a place where people would go and you'd walk on the roof and things like that. And so it, because it would become hard, it'd, be, it'd form a hard surface and people would literally trample over it. And he said that's the only thing that non-salty salt is good for, to be trampled under your feet. Salt that is not salty is useless. And Jesus is saying that a Christian that loses their Christian distinctiveness is useless. That's what Jesus is saying. A Christian that has lost their Christian distinctiveness is useless. What good is it if we call ourselves a Christian if we're just like the world? What good is fitting in with the world when it's the very things that make us different from the world that give us something to actually offer the world? I think the clearest example of this is American mainline denominations. You can look at many of these denominations, and and many of them have followed the exact same trajectory. They have embraced the world's position on a number of issues, particularly uh, LGBTQ issues, issues of gender and sexuality. And almost all of them are in a free fall, a free fall in terms of membership. I read about one denomination, and it said, and they, 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 they were saying this. They were, it was like some conference that they had. They said, in 30 years, there'll be nobody left. A denomination that once had millions of adherents, in 30 years, there'll be nobody left. How is that possible? How is that possible? Well, I hate to state the obvious, but I think it has to have something to do with this, that when you embrace everything the world embraces so that the beliefs of the church are virtually indistinguishable from the beliefs of the culture, then why should anyone go to church? Because you've got nothing to say to them that they don't already believe. You've got nothing to offer. All, if you're going to tell them what they already believe, they don't need to show up for church. It's just going to be an echo chamber for the voices that they're already listening to. And in addition to that, I think this may even be more of the real issue is this, is that the Bible is so clear on some of these issues, so clear that it's virtually impossible to deny those things and then still act like you take the Bible seriously. And so to deny these things, you're basically laying your card out on the table saying, I don't believe this. And a church that doesn't take itself seriously, that doesn't take its own doctrine seriously, a church that doesn't take its Bible seriously is a church that doesn't even take itself seriously. And I hate to say it, but the reality is is the world can see that. If you don't take yourself seriously, why should I come and take you seriously? If you don't even take yourself seriously. Which, it, which is a great irony is that despite the increasing cultural displeasure with uh, what the church has believed for 2,000 years on many of these issues, it's actually the conservative evangelical churches that are growing. They're the only ones that are growing. Why is that? It's not to pat ourselves in the back. What it is is it saying is that, at least, that even a lost person can say, I might not agree with what they believe, but at least they take what they say, at least they take the Bible seriously. At least they take what what they say they believe, at least they take it seriously. At least they seem to believe what they say they believe. And, And what people, I think there is a lot of people today who don't know what to believe. They don't know what to believe. And so they'll, t- they'll they're, so what they're looking for is someone who just seems to think they know what to believe. And 
And that gives us an opportunity here. That gives us an opportunity to say, no, it's not popular. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you can have it. It's yours. You just got to surrender to him. And so what we must do, church, is we must beware of losing our saltiness. We must beware of losing our saltiness. Okay? So we have to ask ourselves, myself, yourself, we have to ask, where has the world creeped in on my life? Where has it creeped in? Where do I think more like the world than like Jesus? Do people who know you, do they know that you're a Christian? Do they know that? You know, I feel like some people, they're so afraid of being, mal- being called a Bible thumper that they've basically been shamed into silence about their faith. But let me tell you something. There's, there's a whole lot worse things you can be called than a Bible thumper. No, we don't need to be jerks. No, we don't need to be arrogant. But reality is, is we're reaching a point where even just to say you believe the things we believe is going to get you all kinds of scorn. But let me tell you something. I'd rather be called a Bible thumper by the world than be called a worldling by Jesus Christ. His is the only opinion that's going to matter. So what do we do? We need to pray, God, wean me from the world. That's probably one of the things, that's probably one of my most common prayers. God, wean me from the world. Make me separate. Don't make me less, make me more Christian. Make me holier tomorrow than I am today. Make me less in love with the world tomorrow than I am today. Make me saltier. Only God can do that. Make me saltier for you. And we can slow the decay in this world. So number one, salt for Jesus. Number two, shine for Jesus. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Okay. So similar to being salt here, he says that we're the light of the world. So I think, again, Jesus is implying that the world is dark. And so, that's, again, it's that's the same uh, analogy there with the salt. We live in a dark world. Okay, And then the point of Jesus' analogy of being a city on a hill and a lamp on a stand is that you, know, you, can't, you can't hide a city on a hill. And in fact, many cities were walled with this white stone that literally gleamed in the sun. And so it was like, it, it was impossible to be hidden. And in the same way, Jesus said, you don't light a lamp and put it under a stand. That's just, it's ridiculous, all right? You light a lamp, I mean, and put it under a basket. You light a stand, so you, you light a lamp so you can put it on a stand. And so... It'll give light to people who see. And so what Jesus, what Jesus seems to me to be saying is that if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, Jesus has lit your lamp. And guess what? He lit your lamp not to put you under a basket. He lit, he lit your lamp so that your light would be seen by others. That's the whole point. And, what, what, and so... Uh, in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, the Apostle Paul said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you see that? Paul likens becoming a Christian to a recreation. We have been born again. Behold, he who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We have been recreated. When a, when a person creates something, we don't, they don't create for no purpose. A carpenter goes into his workshop. A potter goes into his studio. And he doesn't go in there thinking, I'm going to make something useless today. He goes in there thinking, I'm going to make something profitable, useful. God recreated us in the likeness of his son. Why? For good works. The Bible says, for good works. He made us so that we would make a difference in the world, so that we would shine the light of Christ in the world by the goodness of our lives. So if you're saved in here this morning, you're saved, you, God saved you not so that you could fill a pew. He saved you so that your life could be totally transformed into one that is full of good works. 
Denying yourself, being like the good Samaritan, doing tangible acts of love and self-sacrifice, meeting needs, going out of your way to help others. Because Jesus said the world would know we're his disciples by our love for one another. And so as we shine the light of Christ with our lives, people will see it and they'll give glory to our Father who is in heaven. They'll give glory to our Father who is in heaven. That's the last thing this morning. Is the purpose. That's the ultimate purpose. We were saved for good works, but there's a, there's, a, there's a purpose behind the purpose. There's a purpose behind being the purpose of being saved for good works, and that is to give glory to God. We exist for God's glory. We were made for God's glory. Everything that we do is to be to the glory of God. And everything that we do for others is in the hope and prayer that they would then see those good things and give glory to the God who deserves it. Everything is for the glory of God. God constantly is, is pointing us and pushing everything to himself. Why? Because there's nothing like him. He, he alone is God. When you, when you, if, if you go to the Grand Canyon and you look at the Grand Canyon and you stand over the edge and you say, wow. All that, that feeling, if you've ever seen something like that, so spectacular, like, or for example, hearing a newborn baby cry. And you say, wow. All that is, all that is, is God looking over your shoulder saying, I made that. That's mine. The vast stretches, the vast stretches of the universe, the, the vast 99.99999% of which we will never know and could ever know, the vastness of the universe exists for God to tell you, I'm bigger than the universe. It's me. Everything exists for his glory. So we're to work and to act and to give and to serve and to love in such a way that people will see and give God what God is due. Glory in heaven. So as we close this morning, let's be salt, church. Let's be light. Tonight I'm going to talk about some ways that I think we as a church, some, some simple ways I think we could be shining the light a little brighter, be a little saltier. For people who visit our church, I want you to come, I want you to check it out. And the final thing I want to say is this, is that maybe you can't begin being salt of the earth because you're something different. You're not salt yet. You don't have the light of Christ in you. That could change today. Jesus Christ is in the, (laughs) he's in the work of soul transformation, heart transplantation. If salt has lost its taste, how can it be made salty again? It can't. With man. (laughs) But with God, all things are possible. So if you turn from your sin and believe in Jesus and embrace him as Lord and Savior of your life, he'll make you in who you were meant to be. You can join us in slowing the decay of this world and being light for him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning.